Hello, my name is Jamie Candler, and I want to welcome you to worship here at First Methodist Mansfield. If this is your first time in worship with us, we want to extend a warm welcome to you as well. Before worship begins, there are three things I would love for you to know. First, we want to connect with you. So whether you're worshiping online or here in the sanctuary, I want to invite you to fill out our connection card. You can find that card several different ways. The easiest way is by going to our online bulletin at fmcm.org slash bulletin. You can also text the word connect to this number you see on your screen, or you can simply scan the QR code located on the pew back in front of you, and it will take you right to the online bulletin. Second, we want to help you take your next step on your faith journey. If you are interested in becoming a member of First Methodist Mansfield, please stop by our connecting point located outside of this worship space or text the word join to the number on the bottom of your screen. Our connecting point is a great place to stop by and ask any questions you may have or find ways to get plugged into the life and ministry here at First Methodist Mansfield. Lastly, if you are interested in making a gift today, you can do so by visiting one of our drop boxes located outside this worship space or by going to our online bulletin at fmcm.org slash bulletin. Our mission is to make immature disciples of Jesus Christ who love God, love others, and serve the world. For more information about First Methodist Mansfield, please feel free to visit our website at firstmethodistmansfield.org or follow us on social media, download our FMCM app, or text FMCM to 817-477-6498 to stay up to date with everything happening here. Good evening, everyone. Hey, welcome, welcome to Saturday Night Service. Uh, my name is Dylan. Uh, I'm one of the worship leaders here, if we haven't met before. Uh, it's so good to see y'all. Um, I just wanted to start us off uh, today um, uh, with the reading of Psalm 100. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, as many of y'all probably know, uh, me and my family, we got a little sick. Uh, and so in between uh, managing the, the tantrums between the three-year-old and the, the, you know, making sure the one-year-old doesn't get into the pantry too much, uh, I, I just uh, really uh, felt led to that, to that psalm uh, and and decided to write a song uh, about it, inspired from it. And so I just want to read that for us, and then we're going to sing it uh, together. And so I would love if y'all would stand uh, with us. Uh, I think it's going to come up on the screen. There it is. Uh, And I I will read this for us. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us. And we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. So we want to invite you to sing that with us tonight.
is God, and it is He who has made us. We are His, His people, the precious sheep of His past.
so good. Y'all can be seated. So, I know that Dylan just asked you all to sit down. I'm going to ask you all to stand back up. Uh, Dylan, can we, can we do that chorus one more time? Of course. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we, we got a little bit of things going on. I'm host pastoring for myself tonight, and so since I got the mic, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Let me hear that chorus one more time, guys. going on with you, but it is my hunch that all of us need to recognize that we have a champion. When we can't champion for ourselves, we have a champion, and we are who he says we are. Is that worthy of praise tonight? We are who he says we are. That's good news today in a world that doesn't always have a lot of good news to know there is one voice that calls us love. There is one voice that calls us friend. There is one voice that takes our brokenness and builds new life. Now you may be seated. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Julian Hobdi. I'm the lead pastor for this service. I'm also your host pastor for tonight. Uh, and it is always a joy to be here with you. Uh, we have come to the point in our service where it is our, the church that one of the churches T and I used to go to would call this moment the opportunity to prosper. It's our opportunity to be able to give back to God out of the abundance from which God has given us. Now, I want to invite you to take a look at the slide or at the pew backs uh, right in front of you. This is how you can give. And let me tell you, in a church like this, in a city like this, at a moment like this, your dollars go far beyond the walls of this church. And they will be a champion for you far beyond where this ministry may immediately touch. So I want to invite you to give and to give generously because God has given to us. And so now I invite you uh, to this moment where we pray together. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are our champion. Thank you that we are who you say we are. Thank you that you are the captain of our story. No matter the failure that we see, no matter the brokenness that we experience, no matter the death that may surround us and be filled inside of us, we are who you say we are because you are our champion. Your word, your life, your blood, everything that belongs to you goes before us because you are our champion. And we give you glory because no matter where we've been and what we've done, our choices are not the end of our story. Because of what you did with yours, we now have life and have it more abundantly. So God, thank you for being our champion. So now, God, out of love and reverence and remembrance and to reunite us as a community, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. And we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good evening, everybody. There we go. I'm back again. By back, I mean I didn't go anywhere. I just stood right here. Uh, it's so good to be here with you. Um, I've had a very interesting week. Uh, to, this week has been a challenging week. I posted about it recently uh, or earlier in this week. Um, I talked about it last Saturday as well. A close friend of my family's recently passed, um, and so I've been back and forth to Houston twice this week in the midst of trying to write this message. But I tell you, uh, I was there on Monday. On Thursday, I went down to go preach at a youth conference for my wife's cousin's church. Uh, and I am, I am energized and ready and focused and prepared to do this work. So I hope that you brought a towel and your Bibles because we're going to do some work tonight together. Now, y'all know how I am. If y'all want to get out of here on time, you might want to talk back to me. Don't sit here quiet. We're going to be here a while. I'm going to make sure you got the message. If not, we'll be here until kingdom comes. Amen. All right. So uh, if you have your Bibles, let me invite you now to open them to Ephesians chapter 2. I hope you have them with you. If you don't, there are Bibles in front of you. Uh, So open. We are going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be in the first 10 verses. Now, if you do not have a Bible and uh, you used one that's here, but you'd like to have one at home, we would love to get a Bible to you. So you need only send me an email at pastorjulian at fmcm.org, and we will be sure to get a Bible in your hands. So I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing, and if if you're there already, say amen. If you're not, say hold up. Every week, y'all have gotten really good at this. I'm not mad at y'all. For those of you who are using your table of contents, good on you. Good on you. Get on there on time. All right. Uh, So... Before we get to the reading of the text, uh, if you've been here with us a couple weeks or if tonight's your first night, let me let you know where we are. We are in the book of Ephesians, and we're going to be here uh, for many of the months of the summer. We're going to spend some time walking slowly through the entire text of Ephesians. Now, where we've been here so far, and I want to reset some of this, uh, I have tried over the last couple of weeks to instill a single thought in your thinking regarding this text. That simply is this, that understanding the book of Ephesians involves you remembering just two words, in Christ. Now, as I pointed out last week, and it won't be the last time, this text has a particular focus. The book of Ephesians is focused on what God did in Christ and is doing in us through the Spirit. Now, I want to pause briefly to just surround you with what the text is. If you don't know, which I think we've talked about before, but let me remind you that the book of Ephesians is, it's, it's, it's wrong really to call it a book. It's a letter. It is a letter from the Apostle Paul, more than likely, to this collection of house churches in the city called Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was a major city, not, un, not that different from the Metroplex, really, except that it was by a port of water. Uh, And Paul is writing to this community because of some challenges, some unique challenges that this community is facing. Now, this community was a very diverse community, which means, as we know, living in a city like Mansfield, as we do, that diversity is not easy. And when you have a diverse community, you are constantly managing the various traditions and customs and cultures within that community. And the Ephesians were no different. There were divisions that were erupting all over the place, which were in some ways not terribly dissimilar from our own. 
There was infighting and disagreement about how to live their lives together, particularly these Christian Ephesians. And when they were trying to figure out how to do this, when their ideas and self-understandings were oftentimes in conflict. In our text for today, Paul recognized that the source of their conflict was simply the collection of stories that they were telling themselves and holding on to. And to help them unify, he recaptured and reframed the greater story that stands above all the smaller stories that shaped their conflicted life together. It's to that that I want to turn us now to the reading of the text. We're going to read verses 4 through 6 and verses 8 through 10. And the reading of the text goes like this. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, and even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Skipping down to verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When we read scripture, there are times when we read the various stories and see the different accounts and we find moral truths and some moral worth and some education, but we don't always see ourselves in the text. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes we so identify with a character that we wonder if God has superimposed our lives onto theirs or theirs onto ours. But oftentimes, we tend not to see ourselves in their stories. Now, that's not all that surprising. After all, they were dealing with some issues that were different from ours. They were in a time that's very different from ours, and they had different access to things than we have. We don't have the same lives. And it can be hard at times to see ourselves in the text, to see our situation as akin to their own. Their story is simply not exactly our story. But in this text, we can relate to the impact of conflict in diversity that is at the heart of their story. As a society and even in our own community, we have seen and continue to see conflict in our diversity. Can I get an amen on that? In our community, this perhaps shows up most Vividly, and this is where my old, one of my old pastors would say, this is where I go from preaching to meddling. Uh, in our own community, this tends to show up most or most obviously during election seasons. I'm not running for any office, so I don't feel bad saying it. It's just the truth. We see the stress fractures of difference, of our collective difference and diversity more prominently pronounced when we feel the stakes are highest. And when this happens... Conflict is unavoidable. But here's a funny thing about conflict. Oftentimes, David would say, Pastor David would say that it's, whatever it is, it's not about the dishes. It's a joke that he makes about, he and Stephanie haven't gotten into a fight about dishes, but the conflict wasn't about the dishes. It's never all about the presenting issue. At bottom, almost exclusively, conflict amounts to stories. Stories that we have adopted. And if you've been in a conflict, you know something about the extreme power of stories. The stories we tell ourselves, regardless of whether or not they are the truth, become the means by which we interpret and respond to the world around us. Stories are what make the world go round. Our lives are built, shaped, and driven by stories. And the power of a single story can change a moment, a season, dare I say, even an entire life. Stories are perhaps the one thing at the heart of the human experience because stories transcend time and change. It's how we emotionalize 
data, an event happens and without fail, or even intention, we interpret the event and create story to understand it. And we do this all the time, individually, communally, nationally, and even globally. Think about it, after 9-11, news commentators, preachers in pulpits, and friends and families gathered and shared our understanding of what we believe had happened, why it happened, and what we believed would happen next. Some dared to call it God's judgment on the United States. Some saw it as a rallying cry for our nation to come together. We told ourselves stories. I don't mean by stories that we we lied to ourselves. I mean we interpreted the events that were in front of us and we told ourselves something about what that event means. Or at work, if you are on the job and a coworker slights you, or if you're starting a new business and you can't seem to find patrons and clients, you try to make meaning out of the situation. An event happens and we tell ourselves stories. Well, Paul is working toward a better story, a grand story, a story of God's work in the world. God's plan for humanity, which is Paul's story, and all creation ultimately in the book of Ephesians is reconciliation. This is the big story of Ephesians. In other words, God's will is to restore us to the fellowship from which we were originated and to which we were always purposed. Our story with God is a story of restoration. We are a part of that story. But as the case with all stories, all stories have a beginning. And Paul wants to begin by taking us to our beginning. Spoiler alert, it's about to get weird and rough. All right, so Paul had moved and the first thing that he says is, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. I gave you the spoiler alert, I don't feel bad, I'm gonna keep going. Paul is making a statement about our condition coming into this world. He essentially is saying that in our birth, we experienced death. Now, it's important to understand that at its core, death is simply a separation. In other words, we were born separated from life. Born separated from the very source of life, which is God. And this separation we experienced was because we inherited a fallen nature. In case you don't know the story, that's at the beginning of Genesis, our beginning, our foreparents, Adam and Eve, as they are so called, rebelled against God in the garden. And as my old pastor used to say, it may not be our fault, but it has become our problem. We may not have created the circumstances, but we were born into this environment. And before you get hung up there, think of your own circumstances. Because your decisions today don't belong to just you, just like theirs didn't belong to just them. Many of you have done well to establish a legacy for your children, and by virtue of them being your descendants, they benefit from your decision making. In similar fashion, my errors don't belong to just me. My kids will suffer from the choices that I make because we are communally responsible. Our foreparents fell. They rebelled against God, and as a result, our lives were first lived in our sins and our transgressions. That's a bold statement. It's a bold claim, and it may feel unfair. But what was imparted to us was the reality that we were born in our sins, living in our sins and transgressions. Now, some of you who have been walking with us for a couple of months now may remember that I talked about this a little bit before. Uh, It's important for me to make a couple of distinctions, so let me remind you of a few things with regard to sins and transgression. Now, first of all, it's important that we make a distinction here to be made between this powerful message of Scripture and what it is conveying to us. So the Greek word for sin, the Greek word that is translated as sin, it simply means to miss the mark. It's like, if you think of it, it's like an archer using a bow and arrow. And however many shots he takes, every shot he misses the target. 
Now, if you were to see this, troubleshoot this, then you would know that if he continues to miss the target, then something must be wrong with his aim. Their sight isn't quite justified. So from gathering to release, everything begins from a position of already being wrong. So the outcomes are failures because the input has failed. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. The Greek word that is translated transgression meant to step beyond or over. Simply, a better way to say it might be to cross a line or to overstep. Now, the best illustration that I have for this continues to be bowling. I know it's a weird message when I talk about archery and bowling in the same sermon, but just stick with me. I promise I'm going somewhere. Now, with bowling, I am not an avid bowler, although I do bowl a perfect game on the Wii. It's a real thing. I hold it down on the Wii. Some of y'all are looking at me like, what in the world is a Wii? It's fine. Talk to your children or grandchildren, they will tell you. But needless to say, I reign supreme on the Wii. In real life, I'm terrible. I'm trash. I'm horrible. It's no good at all. I only go bowling with other people who can't bowl so that we can have a good time and not compete. So don't send me emails or stuff asking me to go bowling with you. The answer right now is no, I'm not going to go. So, but I learned some things about bowling. So in the bowling alley, in the bowling lane, there's two lanes. There's the gutters. You all knew that. Some of you I know have gotten a good gutter ball. All right. But before you can release the ball or at the front of the lane is an area that's marked by a line. It usually has dots or even lights. That's the foul line. Now, when you gather... That is, when you get ready to release the ball or to throw, you are approaching the foul line. If you cross the foul line, everything after that does not count or counts against you, I should say. So even if you bowl a strike, you get no points because you transgressed the foul line. You crossed over the foul line. And what continues to be interesting to me about the text is that the author is putting together sins and transgressions. It's both. You were in your sins and transgressions. You were dead in your sins and transgressions. What does he want us to see? I'm so glad you asked. When Adam and Eve rebelled, that is when they transgressed a foul line, even everything after that became ultimately a foul. In the same example with the bowling, even our best shot is still a foul because everything after the line was crossed is a foul. So even if our aim is good, our release is true, it's still a foul. And even our very best is still ultimately broken. This is why the author in Isaiah 64 and 6 said, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. Because the debilitating and disintegrating effect of sin is that everything that we do begins from the position of foul. And notice the words sin and transgression are not singular. They are both plural. It would seem to suggest that our sins and our transgressions are not referring to one simple result. Everything in our lives without God are missing the mark because we have inherited and overstepped nature. That felt like the good amen moment. It felt like it. This is our origin story. This is our beginning. We have fallen and we can't get up on our own. There's a sharp turn here in the text. Paul had begun in the first chapter with with praise for all of the wonderful, beautiful, gracious gift of God that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the high and heavenly places. And then he goes into a prayer where he prays that the eyes of our heart would be open so that we can live more fully into this blessed, transformed life. And then by chapter two, at the very beginning, Paul moves from prayer and praise to proclamation. And he's not trying to be cute with it. He wants to be extremely plain. In our sins, in our transgressions, we were dead. We were separated from the source of life. Now, why does Paul go to such great lengths? Does it really require all of this? I mean, it's not exactly a pleasant letter to read. My wife and I, we used to write letters because we were, you know, We were soft like that. So we did. We used to write each other letters. I still got them because I'm soft like that. I'm gushy like that. 
And in the letters, you know, I don't know if I would have lasted if the first line in the letter was, honey, you were dead in your sins and transgressions. Like, I'm going to just fold that back up, <laughs> return that to sender. I don't want to receive that. Why does Paul do this? Why go to such great lengths to make this massive tone in tenor in, the, in this letter? Paul understands that repairing the broken stories that was breaking the community required an understanding of our shared broken past. And more to the point, you cannot heal what you have not acknowledged. See, we tend to have a curious relationship with the truth. If the truth be told, we like the truths that we like. We like the ones that make us feel good. We, we, we like to hear that we are loved by God. We like to hear that we are a friend of God. We like to hear that God has plans and a hope for a, and a future for us. But we don't like to hear that we were sinking in sin. Because of sin, we, have, we were sinking in our relationships. Because of sin, we were sinking in our joy. Because of sin, we were sinking deeper and drowning in our own brokenness. And we like to point to other people's sunkenness, but Paul doesn't give room for that. In verse 3, he says, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. This is Paul. I didn't write this. This is Paul's words. Now, I know there are language differences in translation in the Bible, but I don't know a whole lot. I know I went to seminary. There's a whole lot I still need to know. But as I understand it, all still means all. Every one of us, all of us lived at some point according to this broken way of life. All means all. And because we were dead or asleep, as Wesley calls it, we needed a wake-up call. And in our sin, we were powerless to wake up and to live. But thanks be to God. Now we get to the part where y'all can smile and, and, and look like y'all love me again. That he did not stop there. It was because of God's great love for us. God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that we have been saved. The text says that God is rich in mercy. Now, we, again, we lose words as we, the words get translated into English. It doesn't quite have the same effect, and we don't really capture its meaning uh, by just the word rich, but that word is derived from the idea that it means to be filled to the very brim, an endless, full, complete capacity. So God, who is filled with the brim, with mercy, acted on our behalf. Some of the difficulty that we experience in addition to that is that we simply are unamazed by grace. If we, the truth be told, we just kind of expect it. That's what God is. That's what God do. He gives grace. I'm me, so God should just give me grace. We're unamazed by grace, and we are at times unamazed by mercy. But when I was coming up, I learned that grace was getting what you didn't deserve, and mercy was not getting what you, what you do deserve. Let me give a practical example. There were, there were times uh, when, when my brothers and I, when we were coming up, where uh, well, we, let's say we had done less than we were asked to do in my mother's house. Uh, and we had an expectation of what would happen. Let me just be real. Y'all know how it is. Like, so you're like, your mom's gone. She tells you to clean up. And then you, you don't clean up. But as soon as the car starts pulling in the driveway, then you start cleaning up. So then when she walk in, it looks like y'all been working because everybody's working, but you really just started working. We were those kids. We were those kids. And my older brother would be the first one to fall on the floor. I'm like, Mom, we're just lazy. I'm sorry. Me and my younger brother were like, this dude is stupid. <laughs> Why did he do this? And we expected my mom's reaction because we had a history of what those reactions looked like. But there were times where my mother would surprise us that instead of giving us what we did deserve, she would bring home Popeyes. 
Some of y'all not amazed by that, but for us, that was a treat. <laughs> Went getting Popeyes every week. And she would always bring a little chicken and a pepper. I was like, oh, this is, this is a good day. And we'd be terrified. Like, did she do something to the chicken? Like, why do we have this? Because we did not clean up. <laughs> she was extending to us grace. And then there were other times. Not so different from the not cleaning up, where we had done something where we had earned a specific negative reinforcement. And my mother would stay her hand. She did the inverse of what the text says. She spared the rod and managed not to spoil the children. And in those moments, my mom was extending to us mercy. And in like manner, because of God's grace and mercy, God moved us from despair to hope, from darkness to light, and from death to life. I know this because at one point I was dead in sin. In other words, all of us, we were dead people walking. And when you're dead, that means that you can't move because in sin, we could not animate ourselves. Uh, The dead cannot think. And in sin, our intellect and will were debilitated. The dead cannot sense. And in sin, we could not perceive God and God's call to us. The dead cannot heal. In sin, our sickness was deadly and irreparable. The dead cannot love. In sin, we could not do good or we were able to seek it out. And the dead cannot live. In sin, we were dead, separated from the source of life. All of us, we, all of us were powerless and paralyzed by sin. But I know a story. I've been given a song that what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And for the saints who know something about God's grace and mercy, we know, oh, how precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There we go. I said this before and I will say it again. We can no more save ourselves than dead persons can revive themselves. Yes, we were dead in sin and our transgressions, but catch the underlying reality. That we were dead implies that we were once alive. We were always meant for life. And this is the message of Ephesians. There is a grand story in the text, a story to redeem all broken stories. That story is a story of God's work in the world in us. God's plan for humanity and all creation is and will always be reconciliation. In other words, God's will is to restore us to the fellowship from which we were originated and to which we were always purposed. Reconciliation is the goal. It is always about rescue and restoration. In other words, the first plan, as it was in the garden when our foreparents rebelled, the first plan is the only plan. God's desire and constant work is to make us what we actually are and not what we have simply settled for. God has called us to more. And church, we are the evidence of God's handiwork. At least we ought to be. We must be the living example of what God can do with a life. Death is a separation and sin is the great disintegrator. It took all of our lives, the whole of our lives and disintegrated what was once integrated and full. And when something is disintegrated, it's broken down and made inanimate and weakened. And it's made unfit for its intended purpose. But we were made for connection with God. Our life was always meant to be a synergy of humanity and divinity. It reminds me of one of my favorite songs growing up, and this will be, I'll bring us to a close. Uh, some, of, well, some of you may or may not know about, I won't even ask you to raise your hands, we won't do pop quizzes. The Potter's House by Tremaine Hawkins. Now, The Potter's House is one of my favorite songs. Our keyboardist, Will, is over there with his hand up high, for those of you who can't see it. All right. 
So the Potter's House was a beautiful song by Tremaine Hawkins in the words of the Potter's House. Some of my favorite lyrics were, in case you have fallen by the wayside of life, dreams and visions shattered, you're all broken inside. You don't have to stay in the shape that you're in. Why? Because the Potter wants to put you back together again. In case your situation has turned upside down and all that you've accomplished is now on the ground, you don't have to stay in the shape that you're in. Why? Because the potter wants to put you back together again. And this is my favorite part. You who are broken, stop by the potter's house. You need nothing. You need mending. Stop by the potter's house. Give him the fragments of your broken life, my friend. Why? Because the potter wants to put you back together again. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, is just telling us about the glories and wonder of this masterful potter who wants to simply put us back together again. Our lives were broken by sin, shattered and destroyed by sin, reduced from life to death. But thanks be to God that our story doesn't end there. Yes, our life was broken by sin, but thanks be to God that the potter can and will put our shattered pieces back together again. We have been made alive in Christ, and now we need only live into our restored brought back together again, life. Let's pray. God, thank you that you have never given up on us. That when our failure was full, our devastation was dark, our brokenness had completely broken all that we have seen and known and experienced. At our very worst, you gave us your very best. So because of it, we have been made alive. Help us, God, to see and remember and to be amazed in wonder of this great gift you have given us with life in Christ. Help us to see what we don't see to remember what we forget and let this story of redemption and restoration and reconciliation be the story that guides all of our stories. So when we would try again to choose brokenness, we will choose repair. When we try again to choose death, we will choose life. When we try again to go back, we will walk forward in Christ. And by our example, by being your handiwork, by being these shattered, broken clay pots that you have mended back together. May we help to break the breaks that have broken this world. We will give you thanks and praise for it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
you stand and sing with us? You prepare. You prepare a table right before me. In the presence of my enemies. Though the arrow flies in the tail. So may the peace of God and this goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. And you carry this goodness and mercy and grace and peace out to a hurting world that needs your love, your expression of God's goodness in your life. May you go in peace. Amen.